Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Hello and welcome to our new short format servings of consciously prepared brain food designed to improve your mental fitness. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen, your host. For more than 12 years, we've been proudly and consistently crafting harvesting happiness and sharing it with you. Each week, we spotlight diverse thinkers and doers who are contemporary trendsetters and change agents devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. We invite you to listen up and change the way you think about human happiness. Our award-winning content is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. All righty then, let's dive in. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show where you will learn about sex, biology, and you. My guest today is Dr. Stephen Furlick. Dr. Furlick has been an associate professor at Texas A&M since 2018, having taught and researched at the university level for more than 20 years. He holds a doctor of philosophy in higher education, a master of arts in communication studies, and a bachelor of arts in psychology from Texas Tech University. Dr. Furlick is the author of a breakthrough book, Sex Talk, How Biological Sex Influences Gender Communication Differences Throughout life stages. Welcome, Dr. Furlick. I am excited to talk with you. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about it. Yeah. Well, you know, sex talk is always fun. I just want to say that for all of our listeners. I don't know about you. Clearly, it interests you a lot, Dr. Furlick. Let's talk about the differences between men and women and why we have so much trouble understanding one another. And that's one of the major themes throughout my book is to understand communication from the other person's perspective, the other gender's perspective. So one of the major topics that is throughout the entire book is that it explains the biological reasons for social behavioral differences between males and females. So starting off at conception, everyone pretty much starts off on the same developmental track. And then after about four months after conception, that's when the sex hormones start to uh, differentiate males from females. And that actually influences the brain structural differences between males and females. And some of those areas that are structurally different are in the areas of communication. So just one support of evidence of that is that science now has the ability to analyze the human brain and with over 90% accuracy predict if it's male or female. So there's that much of a difference in the brain structures between males and females that they could analyze it, not know what it is, and predict if it's male or female with over 90% accuracy. So to clarify a little bit about how this presents itself or is evidenced in the world, in other words, I've always thought that, you know, women react to what they hear when we're talking about in sexuality and expression, and men react to what they see. Yes. Males are much more of a visual. That's how we get much more of uh, our information. And then uh, females are much better when it comes to language ability. This has been found early on that females are much better with language ability, the way they read, the way they write, with uh, verbal communication from an early age. And even boys early on have much more language and speech disorders. So there's a, from early on, a different track with language ability and the way that we perceive and understand conversations differently. And there are some biological uh, reasons for that. If you want me to go into a few details. Well, you know, tongue in cheek, I think of, you know, I think men have an extra setting on their hearing called selective. But (laughs) that's just me being silly. Okay, but there is some truth to it. That with, really? So I, I uh, address that there is some brain structural differences between males and females, and the female brain has much more connections across both hemispheres, whereas with males, their brain is much more uh, compartmentalized and more connections within each hemisphere. So therefore, it's much easier for her to activate different areas of the brain, and this actually does happen. There's more overall brain activation during uh, social interactions for her than there is for him. So 
for us, we could do one particular task in a conversation at a time, but to ask us to do multiple things at a time is much more difficult because we just don't have those connections across the different hemispheres or as much activation in different areas as well. That is fascinating. And when we talk about the having communication, better communication at work and at home, how do you recommend that we bridge those stylistic and wiring differences? So during conversations, it's been found uh, numerous biological differences between males and females, how uh, the brain actually perceives and intakes the information and reacts to it. So during social interactions, females are going to have much higher levels of oxytocin and various different types of conversation interactions. And that's that bonding chemical. So you feel more of a connection with the other person. So what does that do? That helps her empathize and understand the other person much more so. She also has more activation in the mirror neuron system. And what that does is it perceives the other person's behaviors. And then it activates your body to prepare to mimic those same types of behaviors. So it's activating similar areas of the brain. And you understand more emotionally what the other person is feeling because your brain and your body is starting to experience it uh, similarly as well. And then overall, she has more brain activation during social interactions. So taking just those three specific pieces of uh, evidence together, she is going to read into subtleties much more so and have a deeper understanding of the conversation, whereas he is going to have a much more literal understanding of the conversation. And then during the the uh, social interaction, uh, brain activation for language, the left side of the brain is activated for the male and for emotion, the right side is activated for the male, whereas with, with the female, more of the overall brain is activated for both language and emotion. So we're much compartmentalized and we could do language or we could do emotion, but expecting us to express our emotions to the same level as what a woman does is not nearly a realistic expectation. And we're not going to pick up the subtleties nearly as much as what a woman does. So bottom line maybe is, and this is a little more opinion on my part, is that maybe she overcomplicates it or overanalyzes the uh, interaction and maybe he oversimplifies it. Yes. Yes, I, I do get what you're saying. And I'm, I'm, you know, using myself, my own thought experiments here. Uh-huh. And I think that that, that that makes perfect sense. But how do we cross the divide? Like if we want him to be more responsive, I'm not even saying for his brain to operate like ours. If we want him to be more responsive, how do we need to, or how can we, distill the delivery of the information down to make sure that it gets the hook? This is sort of my opinion, but I think overall throughout the book, the research and for years and decades, it's shown, and I'll just show this, I'll just say this at the bottom line, that females are just superior social creatures and what males are, bottom line. Dang, Dr. (laughs) Furlick. And I'm not sure who would argue with that, but... It's based upon being able to empathize better, uh, language ability, all those things. So I would place a little more of the burden and emphasis on her to understand that she needs to be a bit more explicit and straightforward when the way she communicates to him for him to understand better, as opposed to trying to place the emphasis and the burden on him to combine all these different facets of communication with emotion and language uh, uh, much better because he's limited in what he could do. So what I'm hearing is this doesn't necessarily need to be complicated. It just needs to be clear. So like making sure, for example, that you have eye contact, that you have his full attention for whatever that amount of engagement is before you present the the question or try to even communicate. Like, is this a good time if we even just start there? That's a good point because we as males are very compartmentalized, like I already uh, talked about, with more connections within each hemisphere. So we could do one task at a time. So if we're trying to do more than one thing at a time, then we get distracted. So especially if it's something important or something that deal with conflict, then I suggest that you set it up in advance and, hey, let's talk about this at this particular time. 
and not have other types of uh, things going on at the same time. So we could concentrate on one thing at a time. And in particular, not when he's trying to rest or relax or whatever, or watch a game or something else. So you're right on that. So once we establish that we have full attention and we clarify and simplify what it is that we're trying to communicate about, then we go in for that conversation and then validate that what we're saying is actually heard and understood? Yes. And there are some things that could be done relationship wise to improve that type of communication that takes place as well. So it's been found that prior to a conflict, having a positive touch increases the oxytocin level, which is that bonding chemical. Yeah. And it helps each person bond with each other. So maybe holding hands or uh, arm around the other or whatever else, that touch prior to a conflict has even found to improve that conflict communication that takes place by increasing the oxytocin level in that bonding chemical. Also, what somewhat of a barometer, I would say, of the health of a relationship and of how well the relationship is doing, but also how it's going to improve understanding is, is mimic behaviors. When non-verbally each person mimics the other person's non-verbal behaviors, that's a, a good sign of a positive relationship, but also it helps to increase the empathy that they have with each other and how much they understand each other because it activates similar areas of the brain so they understand what the other person is actually feeling emotionally as well. So having mimic types of behavior, similar types of nonverbal behaviors can be beneficial as well. And I think that these strategies that you're talking about, they work in relationships of all kind. You know, it, right. it's it not necessarily a romantic relationship and you might not necessarily rub your boss's shoulders at the office, but you might touch their elbow when right. you're trying to get them to pay attention. Right. That's a good point. And I have learned in my house this strategy of well, that light mm. shoulder massage, like when I'm going in for a conversation where I need full uh -huh. attention. And it, uh, it works perfectly because, w and I understand that it's the release of the oxytocin, the bonding hormone. I'm getting him to, poor Christopher, he's the guinea pig on this show. I'm getting him to sort of exhale for a minute and give me his attention. So I know what I'm being, what I'm saying is being heard. Right. And just my, this is just opinion or guess on that also is that maybe he's conditioned that way as well now that, you know, every time she comes in and touch on the shoulder or whatever, then condition that oxytocin is going to increase and cortisol and stress is going to start to decrease. And then I've got his attention. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let, let, let's move on here and talk more about chemicals and biological. You spoke a little bit about the biological differences in the brain, but what about the chemicals? Is it purely the quantity of oxytocin in women versus men that accounts for this? Or are there other chemicals at work and differences there? Yes. So just starting off a little bit, generally off the track and then I'll get back into it is that from an early age, sex hormones play a major role in our social behaviors. So from just a few months of age, it's been found that sex hormones influence our children's play behaviors. Whereas with higher levels of testosterone, it's more associated with uh, what we think of as male typical type of play behavior, such as playing with a truck, active physical types of play, playing with a train. So higher loads of testosterone, but it's even been found that girls who are born with the condition CAH, which is higher levels of the androgen testosterone than what the average girl has, one in 10,000, that they have similar types of, or they have more similar types of play behavior uh, that males tend to have than what the uh, girls not born with that particular uh, condition have. So the underlying thing behind that is that testosterone uh, plays a major role in our interests, our hobbies, our physical types of uh, behaviors. But taking that into uh, language, testosterone hinders language ability. So you can think of sex hormones as maybe like the oil in an engine of a car or a truck, and that sort of runs the rest of the machine. So the sex hormones runs our brain and the rest of our body as well. 
So higher levels of testosterone has been found from an early age to hinder language ability. And with adult males having 20 times as much testosterone as females, so you can see how you can draw the link as to males having an inferior language ability. And estrogen actually helps language ability. And with adult females having about 20 times as much estrogen as what males do, you can see how that makes the gap even larger for females having a better language ability and males have an inferior language. Let's take a pause right there. And when we come back, we will continue the conversation with my guest today, Dr. Stephen Furlick. We're talking about his book, Sex Talk, How Biological Sex Influences Gender Communication Differences Throughout Life Stages. To learn more, please go to www.tamuc.edu. And under people, look up Dr. Stephen Furlick. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back and we will carry on this most interesting conversation. Here comes that pause. We'll be right back. And that is a promise. Hang on just a second here. Before we take that pause, I want to mention how pleasurable daily self-care rituals can contribute to our happiness. Small, consistent actions generate a positive impact in our lives like exercising, journaling, and connecting with friends. And sometimes those small actions pay off in a big way. Way offers a complete hair care solution that promotes fuller looking, healthier feeling, and happier hair for everyone. Fine, medium, or thick hair Way has got you covered. Not sure of your hair type? Take the hair quiz to find the way that will work best for you. I've made Way an integral part of my self care routine for the past several months, and I'm seeing and feeling an improvement in the appearance and quality of my once flat and dull hair. I'm a big fan of Way's hair care products. My go to products are the shampoo and conditioner for fine hair plus the leave-in spray conditioner. They make my hair full and bouncy, not to mention the scent is delicious. Way helps to improve overall hair health with beauty-boosting ingredients that support thicker, shinier, beautiful-looking tresses. Way is an easy and effective go-to hair and scalp health regime because good hair care demands more than just styling. The Detox Shampoo combines clarifying apple cider vinegar and enriching keratin that cleanses impurities, product buildup, hard water deposits, and more that will leave your hair and scalp squeaky clean while bringing it back to life with strength, softness, and shine. Get on your way to healthier hair one day at a time with shampoo and conditioners that are just your type. Go to T-H-E-O-U-A-I.com and use code HH for 15% off your entire purchase. That's T-H-E-O-U-A-I.com, code HH. Now let's take that pause. Each day we have the intellectual freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable, regardless of external circumstance. If you or someone you know is struggling with mental health, urge them to seek professional support because good psychological health is vital in achieving a satisfying life. Visit HarvestingHappiness.com for psychosocial educational resources to boost emotional and social intelligence. Like what you hear on Harvesting Happiness? Sharing is caring. Pay it forward by spreading the word to your tribe through social media. Find us at Harvesting Happiness on Facebook and me at Lisa Kamen on Twitter. And we're back continuing the conversation about sex, biology, and you with my guest, Dr. Stephen Furlick. Let's get back to it. So, Dr. Furlick, prior to the break, you were talking about the difference between men and women and how men have 20 times more testosterone in their bodies than women which accounts for why, metaphorically, men are always thinking with their little heads. And that's one of the things is that you need to think about what, okay, so there's 20 times as much testosterone with the adult male than the female. So what is that associated with? And testosterone is highly associated with three things off the top of my head, probably more, with aggression, and then sex, arousal, interest, things like that, and then also spatial ability. So it's been found consistently that males are much better with cardinal directions than what females are. And part of that is it's how testosterone affects that area of the brain. So the north, south, east, and west, those types of directions, males are much better consistently, it's been found, and testosterone is a major contributor of that as well. 
Fascinating. I want to just ask, I want to throw in a little question there about menopause and an increase in testosterone in women and what that does to us as we age in terms of risk taking, sex drive, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So with menopause itself, estrogen levels start to decrease and the things that are associated with it as well start to go in those directions as well. So her hearing ability how well she can actually hear actually decreases as estrogen starts to drop during menopause as well. So one of the things that has been recognized in science for over 40 years, and I don't think that uh, nearly as much attention has been placed on it, is that the serotonin system, emotion regulation within the body, has been recognized as being sexually dimorphic for over 40 years. So how our bodies regulate our emotions is different between males and females and has been consistently found over and over. Testosterone has, has been used for years to treat depression because that increases the serotonin levels that helps to regulate emotion. So if one person has 20 times as much testosterone as the other person, then that's just one piece of the puzzle that people, and this has been consistently found, that females are diagnosed at a much higher rate with anxiety and depression shouldn't be that much of a surprise. And the X chromosome has been linked to depression as well. So if she has uh, lower levels of testosterone, which increases serotonin levels, and two, two X chromosomes, and anxiety and depression has been linked to the X chromosome, again, um, there shouldn't be that much of a surprise that females are diagnosed at a much higher rate with depression and anxiety than what males are. Is there a natural increase in testosterone, though, in women as they age? As, as estrogen decreases, does testosterone increase or no? No, not, not, not that I found, just more so that estrogen starts to decrease. Ah, I thought that there, was a, there had been a slight increase in, in testosterone, which makes women as we age more inclined to risk take and um, be a bit more aggressive, or maybe that's just, uh, you know, the school of hard knocks. <laughs> we get to a certain age and we don't care. I think that has more to do with the estrogen drop-in than whatever, you know, smaller amounts of testosterone that may increase. So the estrogen drop-in is much more substantial, much more rapid on the onset of menopause. And I think that's what kicks in all those other factors as well. So um, estrogen is related with relationship type of interest and ability. And then that those types of outcomes, relationship, investment, and ability, and motivation, all those things start to drop at the same time that estrogen drops as well. So I think it's more of the estrogen factor um, than would be uh, the testosterone. So let me m move the conversation to questions and answers. In your book, Sex Talk, you discuss why guys answer only questions that are asked and why women answer unasked questions. I think this is very funny and very true. Okay, that's a good question. And I think that's one of the things that we need to try to understand is that when he answers a question, and it's just a few words, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's emotionally removed or doesn't care, but uh, we're much more compartmentalized. So we could do one task at a time, but we can't tie in nearly as well the topic and emotion and past events as much as she can because she has more connections to those areas of the brain and also a larger and more active hippocampus, which is involved with memory and also emotion and uh, language ability as well. So it helps all those with the larger and more active hippocampus and more connections to different areas of the brain. So she's very equipped to do that um, than what males are, along with estrogen helps language ability and testosterone hinders language ability. So again, you, we should understand from the other person's uh, perspective what their capabilities are. Got it. I, 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 this is fascinating to me. Um, let's talk about stress and the differences between men and women and how we handle stress. Okay. So what's been found over and over is that um, 
generally speaking, I'll say that and then go in a little more detail, is that it's much more of an emotional, intense type of experience, social interaction for females than it is for males. So during social interactions, looking at a face, they have more activation, females do, in the emotional areas of the brain. So they're much more emotionally invested in that social interaction that takes place, regardless if it's romantic or workplace or whatever else. Taking that a step further, it's even been found that negative subliminal faces increases more emotional activation for the female than it does for the male statistically. So not even knowing that, neither person knows that they're looking at a negative emotional face because it's subliminal. She still has more activation in the emotional areas of her brain than what he does to negative faces that aren't even uh, consciously recognized. Well, I think that that's probably true. I mean, when, women will be more apt to say, well, why did you look at me that way? <laughs> you know? Right, right. Like, huh? Are you upset with me? Why did you look at me? Like, gave me stink eye. No, no, I didn't give you a stink eye. I was just looking at you. And over and over, it's been found that females are much better able to label other people's emotions in various types of circumstances what males are. It's even been found they did a study and they had like a screen or like a curtain or a screen or whatever. And they had two people just not see the other person, just reach across and grab the other person's hand. And females outperformed substantially males in identifying the other person's emotional state just by touch alone. Wow, that is a fascinating finding. We are nearly out of time, and I want to make sure that we touch upon sexual intimacy differences and the and the physiology of love. Because we are hardwired so differently, um, I think that oftentimes we run into little snags in the bedroom and in matters of the heart. Talk a little bit about that. Yes, um, I think that uh, it needs to be taken into consideration that, again, um, for males, we're a bit more uh, compartmentalized, and it's wherever the specific task at hand is. Um, and then for females, it's more of a, everything's more uh, connected, overall connection with everything influences all the other parts as well. So she needs to understand for her that she needs to be in a more overall uh, state of rest before there's any chance of romance to occur. That if they're at home and the kids are being disrupted or she had something happen at work or whatever, all those things need to be settled before she would be ready for some sort of intimacy to occur. Whereas with him, he could shift and concentrate going from work where there's a lot of conflict to intimacy in just a few minutes at home and shift his focus. So it's a more overall body experience for her than it is for him. And during sexual intimacy as well, uh, we need to understand that she is more emotionally invested in it. And that is uh, much more of a bonding type of uh, experience for her overall. And that um, it's through language is a major part for her, um, the bonding and how oxytocin uh, increases as well. So during the sexual intimacy and orgasm, his task at hand, to some degree, he thinks is somewhat complete after orgasm with her. The relationship continues after that as well with maybe talking or cuddling or whatever else. So it's much more complicated and much more extensive for her of experience than it is for him. Well, for him... The orgasm is the sleeping pill, which is, you know, one of the questions I, I love asking the researchers who come on this show to explain to me what is it about the orgasm that is, you know, making the hormonal sleeping pill happen, right? Is it the sprint of the, the cardiovascular experience? Is it the release of the orgasm itself that just sort of seems to like shut down the brain and the body. And it's like, you know, we, the gals are sitting there toe tapping, like, you know, I'd like a word with you or two or three before right. we pass out. Right. Yeah. I think it's a, it's just like everything in life. It's a combination of factors. So just like you talked about some of those physiological uh, factors that come into play, the heart rate, the exhaustion, maybe the testosterone drops right afterwards. But then also uh, like we already talked about, 
females are much superior social creatures, and we're not. So we all understand nearly as well that that's only part of the intimacy, that there are other important parts as well. That's not the end, but that her needs continue beyond that. And I think a lot of times males just don't understand that her needs continue beyond that in terms of language and communicating with each other and communication through touch or whatever else. Well, let me ask you a question about the intimacy angle from the male perspective, because in speaking to a lot of men you know, on this subject, men will often say that for them, the sex is not necessarily intimacy. It's sex. Whereas women will say that sex is part of the intimacy. Yes, and I think that is part of the differences and somewhat of the misunderstanding as well. That's much more of the emotional investment for her. And you can see how the evolutionary it is because she's much more invested in it. If there's a pregnancy that occurs, she's carrying the baby, you know, for nine months. Whereas with him, there's less of an evolutionary type of investment if pregnancy were to occur. So I think the relationship value is much more higher during that for her than it is for him. And also when we talk about what we're biologically wired to do, right, you know, in terms of procreation, I mean, the man is there to procreate, you know, to propagate and, you know, expand the bloodline. So from uh, like a Neanderthal kind of perspective, that job gets accomplished with orgasm and he's done. I mean, that's not to say there aren't men who are more evolved. There are, but... Right. Is that what you're kind of hinting at or trying to say? Yes, that's kind of where I was going at. And <laughs> what's your thoughts? Do you think that I'm on the right track with that? I, I mean, I sense that that is true. I mean, all kidding aside, you know, w- when we joke about our differences, you know, when we look to what our bodies, our human bodies as men and women were designed to do, the man is designed to ejaculate his seed and impregnate the woman. And then the, the woman's body becomes the incubator for this child. So she right. is going to be more emotional. She is going to be more attached, you know, than the man. And she has more at stake than what he does, you know, if a pregnancy does occur. So you can see how she would be much more attuned to, emotionally invested in all those things, because she needs to make sure that this is the right you know, person to be intimate with yeah. and not make a mistake because that could cost her, you know. Security. I mean, if you just right. from in a for primitive need, right, that it could it co- could cost her security. Right. Or safety. Right. All those things. That and more. But we're nearly out of time and I feel the need to give a shout out to my partner who I love and adore, even though you are a guy. <laughs> You're my Uh guy. And I think the more we understand how each of us is wired, the easier it becomes to reach across the divide and say, hey, I get you or I want to get you. And it's it's okay. Yes. And uh, I have a chapter in there, chapter 12, Women's Sixth Sense. And I go over how each of the five different senses has been found um, consistently that females are superior in all five senses. Well, you know. That just puts a smile on my face, right? Because I'm sure there are a lot of women listening to this show. They're like, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, and uh uh-huh. And hearing that the research supports that is validating. But more importantly, when we have that knowledge, it then becomes incumbent upon us to be the ones that might reach across the divide and say, you know, you're important to me. I want to understand you. And let me show you how it might make it easier. Right. So she's going to pick up on much more of the subtleties than what he is, is yeah. the bottom line. Yeah. Of. This has been a great conversation, Dr. Furlick. Thanks for coming on and hanging out. Thanks. I enjoyed it. And I'm glad that you found it uh, relatable and useful. Oh, always. This is fantastic stuff. And the challenge uh, for each one of us is to go home or go back to our offices and put some of these suggestions into action. To learn more about Dr. Stephen Furlick and his book, Sex Talk, How Biological Sex Influences Gender Communication Differences Throughout Life Stages, please visit www.tamuc.edu.
E-D-U. That's Texas A&M's website. And under people, look up Stephen Furlick. Thanks again, Dr. Furlick. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa Cypress-Kamen on behalf of my guest, Dr. Stephen Furlick, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes from our mental muscle toning libraries at HarvestingHappinessTalkRadio.com, Toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more about my global consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following me on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced by me, Lisa Cypress Kamen, Andrea Mangeli, Robin Boyd, Andrea Daly, and the awesome team at Podfly Productions, including Eric Begay, Kimberly Beck, and Alec Gus, in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU Radio Malibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.